There is nothing wrong with your radio. Do not attempt to adjust the volume. We are controlling the broadcast. For the next hour we will control all that you hear. You are about to experience the knowledge and insights of the media mothership. Yes, indeed. Welcome officially to Media Mothership Broadcasting out of Edge Radio Studios in Ipaluna, Hobart, Tasmania. On Media Mothership, we explore how media can shape our understanding of the world around us. I'm your host, Dr. Craig, and we're streaming over a couple of platforms, including uh, edgeradio.org.au, as well as YouTube and Twitch, if you want to jump on those streaming platforms, uh, you can find us by just searching Media Mothership, as well as on The Dab. Uh, you can message us on the chat at YouTube and Twitch or SMS, SMS us directly into the studio on 4 707. Today's topic is looking at some interesting aspects of AI and some, uh, you know, fun ways in which pop culture has led people to be arrested as well as giving them good ideas for names of things. Would you believe? All this and more on Media Mothership. Okay, let's have a look at this first unusual article uh, headlined. Uh, you can now get AI Judy Garland or James Dean to read you the news. This is a piece from Engadget uh, talking about how a company called Eleven Labs has made a deal with the estates of famous deceased actors for their new reader app. So the article goes on to talk about how uh, this startup has created this app, which will narrate ebooks and PDFs for you uh, in the voice of a dead celebrity. And this, uh, at this point, they've been able to get a couple of uh, estates signed up to it. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, Judy Garland being one of them. Um, let's listen to how they try to explain this, and then we'll look at some of the uh, implications that uh, this might lead to. Eleven Labs is proud to introduce the iconic voice collection. Choose from our exclusive selection of famous AI voices, including the illustrious Judy Garland, Able to read your favorite stories, publications, and uploads in the most authentic way possible, including The Wizard of Oz. At that moment, Dorothy saw lying on the table the silver shoes that had belonged to the Witch of the East. So download the Eleven Labs Reader app today. Your favorite stories with your favorite iconic voices. So it'll be interesting to see how the popularity of these voices will relate to people wanting to hear various texts read back to them. Uh, obviously, it's interesting that uh, the, the legal headaches of this clearly have been um, circumvented by getting the estates of these deceased actors to sign off. And I notice while they only highlight Judy Garland there in the YouTube video, they've got Burt Reynolds, James Dean, Sir Lawrence Olivier as other names there. So... <laughs> You know, it would be fascinating to see how this uh, influence and cultural significance of these celebrities uh, will get appropriated into hearing them read back a book and, and uh, an unusual text, maybe science communication. Maybe it could be used to make a science textbook or a really boring textbook more exciting. Uh, yeah, unusual, unusual. Uh, so it'll be fascinating to see what voices could be created from that. A contrast to this story can be seen, though, in a piece IGN recently posted up t 
titled Morgan Freeman Thanks Fans for Highlighting Unauthorized Use of AI to Imitate His Voice. Um, these are cases where someone's been posing uh, uh, or, or using AI to replicate the voice. We did an uh, example of that a few weeks ago on Media Mothership where we talked about the Baldur's Gate 3 mod which replaces the narration there with David Attenborough's narration, giving it that weird documentary vibe to a fantasy role-playing game like Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, this one's, of course, talking about here's the case where it's fake, where it's created without the permission and often used you know, uh, maybe playfully or maybe maliciously. Certainly in the past, there's been cases such as the infamous case of Tom Hanks's voice being used to uh, as part of an online ad for a dental plan, right? So Tom Hanks's voice was used uh, without his permission to basically spruik a, a dental plan. Uh, Robin Williams's daughter has also condemned the disturbing use of AI to create a late father's voice, and there's many others. So, you know, again, a bit of a wild west here. Uh, two interesting contrasting stories, though. One where an estate has secured, uh, sorry, an AI company has secured the uh, estate uh, of the dead actors to give their voice uh, permission for it. Another one where people are just grabbing it. So it does show you this technology uh, can be used, um, you know, w without uh, uh, legal or uh, uh, means as well. All right, while we're talking about the law, the next interesting story uh just from today, was British man carrying Legend of Zelda sword in public as a fidget toy sentenced to four months jail. So this is being posted on ABC News, and there's a picture here of a 20-centimeter kind of prop sword that... Um, was spotted by people from the public and then police, yeah, police stopped him uh, after CCTV footage showed Barry, the guy, carrying something suspicious. Officers approached Bray as, uh, as they saw he was carrying a blade. And when he was arrested, uh, Bray claimed that the sword, which is just an imitation of the Master Sword from Legend of Zelda, a popular Nintendo game, he was using it as a, as a kind of fidget device, something he could use to keep his hands busy. So, of course, fidget toys were incredibly popular a few years back. Those were made of the spinners. And, you yeah, know, they, they used to help people who are... Uh, uh, looking for a way of concentrating or relieving some nervous energy. And sadly, it looks in this case, Bray attempted to use that as a rationalization for carrying this 20 centimeter long uh, prop. Um, and, and look, if you look at it, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a metal coating to it. Uh, so, so it's not a, a kind of clearly, dis you know, toy type object uh so you know it, bray tried to explain though that that he wouldn't use it as a weapon but nevertheless the uh, police have said they have a zero tolerance of bladed articles in public this is in warwickshire uh and uh, he fell afoul of this so uh yeah he was then given this 154 pound charge as well as four months jail so let's hear a little bit about what this master sword is from uh dr willie <laughs> who has part one of the history of the master sword the master sword it's a legendary blade in the zelda series and it's seen in multiple games but what is the story and history behind this blade who made it and what happened to it in the end
It all started after sealing away Demise. The goddess Hylia created Phi, an intelligent humanoid spirit who resided in the sword and gave it the purpose of assisting her chosen hero throughout his journey. Eventually, in order to open the gate of time at the sealed grounds, Impa explains to Link that he must seek out the three sacred flames and purify the sword in their heat. Each time Link bathes the goddess... Yeah, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I don't know if that helps explain the Master Sword any further, but clearly it's a significant prop. It's interesting, the cultural significance showing here in this story of the guy arrested for walking around with a 20 centimeter uh, Master Sword from Legend of Zelda prop. Uh, the, the popularity of video games like Legend of Zelda and how, I guess, if you know that it's from a video game like Legend of Zelda, if the public perception of walking around with a replica or collectible of the Legend of Zelda Master Sword would uh, 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 be helpful. You know, maybe if one of the police officers was a huge Legend of Zelda fan. I doubt it, though. I mean, if you have a look at the sword, it looks like someone who, who didn't, if they didn't know it was a Legend of Zelda video game sword, would just treat it as a real sword. Potentially anyone could, even if you knew it was that, because it does look quite metallic and pointed. So this is that legal interpretation, you know, that the incident does reveal the legal systems, I guess, understanding of even though it's a pop culture artifact right and there are plenty of people that would maybe in a convention uh, uh go into cosplay uh dress up as a favorite character but even those convention spaces are quite rigorous in terms of ensuring that any swords or guns are um uh, abide by strict protocols in fact i don't even know if you could bring a sword in, uh, you, you know, if it, if it looks vaguely realistic. Uh, because, yeah, that, that could this be used as a potential weapon? Uh, socially, of course, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, could, it, could, could the Legend of Zelda sword be perceived differently across different cultures? Yeah, maybe if you're at a convention and you had that sword, people might not call the police... Depends on the sword. In this case, you know, again, if you're looking still at a sword that might have metal plating or, a, a, you know, a metallic spray paint over it, um, you know, if it looks close to a real thing, who knows if it's not or not. And, of course, you know, here it's interesting, this kind of neurodiversity point that he was saying it's a, it's a fidget toy. So are there implications in terms of... Um, the the need for those that are neurodivergent to have fidget toys which they feel are going to be meaningful to them and helpful to them. Uh, and I guess how to also unpack those choices in terms of saying, well, of course, to you, that might look fine. You wouldn't use it as a weapon. But for someone in the public that doesn't know it's the Master Sword from Legend of Zelda and you're using it as a fidget toy, would they feel threatened? And uh, again, as the police said here, zero, uh, uh, zero tolerance. So this poor guy, possibly poor guy, got pushed into, um, yeah, quite a fine and uh, four months jail. Yeah. Right, okay, so next up... Uh, let's have a look at the intriguing issue of, let's go into, uh, well, yeah, I guess we've had people using pop culture in a way which makes people in the public feel afraid. Here's an example of people using pop culture, which hopefully maybe helps people understand something better. Uh, this is from IGN.com. It's a story talking, uh, headlined, Scientists name newly discovered eyeless spider after blind flying wyvern from Monster Hunter. <laughs> so this is from the video game series Monster Hunter. Uh, turns out that um, a newly discovered spider from China has been named the Otocilia Kezu after Kezu, the flying wyvern from the video game Monster Hunter. 
Um, spiders and wyverns don't really have anything in common, but it is intriguing that this popular culture video game series was cho- chosen to to name uh, this newly discovered spider. Um, and yeah, I guess Kezu, which uh, looks uh, a fairly normal wyvern um, from the 2004 Monster Hunter series, has maybe some scary links to the spider that's there. It's worth looking at the the whole image. There are plenty other examples of scientists doing the same. The Sorona butterfly was named after the Lord of the Rings villain, Sauron. I see Sauron. Uh, they've added an A to it. Sauron, Sauron uh, butterfly. Venomous Tom Hardy was somewhat bizarrely named after Tom Hardy's Venom films. And the Tachi Men Otis Harrison Fordy snake was, of course, named after the Indiana Jones actor. Uh, it's intriguing, again, this idea of how uh, media influence is occurring here in terms of naming new species after pop culture references uh, could reflect the influence of media on scientific practices. I wonder how many people that are doing scientific practices are huge fans or nerds or geeks of particular pop culture and are more than happy to dig into that well of their pop culture knowledge to help them name the real world around us. Interesting that, of course, the choice of names, uh, like the venomous Tom Hardy uh, for that snake, uh, suggests about the cultural significance of video games and movies in contemporary societies. Because I guess if you think about the naming of dinosaurs back in the uh, late 1900s, it was, uh, you know, your kind of... Uh, Greek words, Tyrannosaurus Rex, so forth. Uh, This idea of classics to give that sense of wonder and awe to these huge fossilized dinosaur remains. Uh, Does it diminish it somewhat that we're choosing um, pop culture names and actor names for uh, discoveries that we're making? Or does it make it more relatable? Does it give them a kind of interest and media cut through they wouldn't otherwise have. I mean, would IGN be reporting on another classic Greek term used to name this spider? I don't think so, right? I mean, the reason that maybe they chose this Monster Hunter name was to get a bit of media coverage, science communication, right? So how might people use popular culture references uh, in uh, science to uh, impact this public engagement with science, right? I mean, maybe uh, uh, to bring more dramatic issues facing us that science needs to communicate, the climate change and so forth, could we use some scientific nomenclature that uses pop culture terms? Uh, and, yeah, could there be a bit of a cross-disciplinary impact, you know, how these naming conventions illustrate this maybe wonderful intersection of science and media studies or fan culture or Hollywood into uh, science. It's intriguing, the interplay between science, media, culture. Who knows? Who knows? It is uh, quite funny, the uh, venomous Tom Hardy in particular. All right, uh, let's change gears a little bit. I mean, we started the uh, media mothership talking a little bit about how there were concerns about AI voices, Morgan Freeman thanking his fans. So again, in that case, fans being the custodians of Morgan Freeman's ownership over his voice and alerting him when fans find people using Morgan Freeman's voice so then Morgan Freeman can take legal action. Here we have an interesting issue which has been causing headaches for a number of photographers on Instagram. This has been reported on from The Verge as well as many other 
news platforms. The Verge points uh, has headlined that Instagram's made with AI label swapped out for AI info after photographers' complaints. This is a story about how AI have been labeling uh, images posted up to Instagram where a some form of bots or processing has, has identified the image that's been uploaded as based on AI, they feel. So there's been this made with AI thing that's caused people to be really pissed off when in fact they uploaded photos which weren't made with AI. Uh, of course, some of these have been quite clearly wrong. Uh, this is the case of former White House photographer Pete Souza, who pointed out the tag was linked to a photo he uploaded, which was taken over 40 years ago of a basketball game, right? <laughs> so he, he could only guess that maybe this was caused by the fact he used uh, 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 Adobe's cropping tool and flattening images that may have triggered this this headache. So as They've done this. They've now said, oh, okay, well, uh, maybe there's some way of, of fixing it. Who knows? Who knows? It's, it's interesting. Uh, in this case, I guess the, the thing with the AI voice, uh, the AI swapping is, you know, the impact that this shows. I mean, if I was to create something and suddenly there's a label underneath it saying made with AI... Uh, and I hadn't made it with AI, uh, the public perception of it might be changed. Well, to help us resolve this issue, a uh, special guest has arrived in the studio to help us further mm -hmm. understand how Instagram's made with AI label swapping out to AI info might impact creative talent. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, Lord Taylor in. I know that uh, Taylor Lidstone, yep, Hey, uh, himself is is a creator. Yeah. Um, I, I've got the article up on there. I mean, it's not the, the K-pop one. We'll get to grant that in a second. Yeah. So there was an interesting little piece about um, the use of AI labeling. I don't know if you've seen it. The um, keep, keep flicking across to uh, uh, not that one. This yes, one. this one. Yeah. So Instagram. Have you have you heard of this where Instagram um, was labeling photos that people were uploading mm -hmm. as made with AI and a number of photographers were saying, hey, this photo was like 50 years ago <laughs> <laughs> from a, of a basketball match. Uh, it's not AI. So they've changed it to AI info. It's interesting mm -hmm. because I, I came across it for a promotional poster and people were – really policing these days, is this image AI or not, mm -hmm. right? There seems to be this big debate around being able to forensically look at stuff on Instagram or other spaces, particularly when it's produced by a big company. Mm -hmm. And then someone's saying, oh, this is definitely AI. This is something which is just fake. Look at the number of, look at the hand, right? The hand thing is no longer as big of a tell as it mm -hmm. used to be. But the what the, the conversation on the internet seems to drive towards is someone proving or, or saying, oh, no, if you look at the way that angle is and that way that expression is, it's clearly AI, from which there's then a um, uh, backlash, right? Like mm -hmm. it seems like the only pathway that's headed towards is this kind of, um, um, uh, you know, like in one of those Frankenstein movies where you have the peasants rioting with their... Um, torches to mm -hmm. witch hunt to then, you know. So it is it is this thing that artists are saying, you know, once once this automated process was labeling your photo, photo as AI, it meant you were then going to be uh, attacked. Yeah. So there's this question of, of course, metadata interpretation, you know, the challenges which Instagram and other places have. And then on the other hand, the challenges of 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 tools like Adobe Photoshop. Like mm -hmm. once you start using Adobe Photoshop on a photo, if you've got Instagram and other platforms policing or labeling AI when they feel they've detected it, um, what responsibility does Adobe Photoshop have to let you know, hey, you know, you're now at 30% AI 
mutated yeah. <laughs> or AI altered this. I mean, it's almost like, you know, a turn it in assignment submission mm. in terms of like how, what percentage does this appear to be plagiarism now? Uh, so it's fascinating to me in terms of the, the what this will unleash around metadata mm. interpretation. Uh, and then, you know, authenticity, content authenticity, right? So I guess what this is trying to do is is give artists that are genuinely creating content this stamp of, yes, you're authentically human and this is an authentically human-created experience you're enjoying uh, uh, from from others which are, which are kind of going to be AI-based. Or, or... The thing that gets me is how it says the photographer uploaded a photo 40 years ago and speculated that using the cropping tool and flattening images might have triggered it. Why is that information allowed within the image anyway? Because those are very low-level yeah. sort of manual-based things. Well, he was guessing, I guess, there. So he said, yeah, there was a photo that he put up of the basketball game. It got flagged as made with AI. He couldn't figure out why it had been flagged with mm-hmm. AI. And, uh, yeah, speculating that maybe all he did to it was retouch it with mm-hmm. Adobe, but maybe that was enough somehow for it to see the image as no longer the quality that would be a 40-year-old photo mm. quality, but instead... Uh, but yeah, look, I think that's the question, though, right? As, as, as a creator, what role does AI now have in your workflow if you've got these implications, right? Mm. I mean, I, I think that uh, AI has pretty much been integrated into a lot of creative workflows, mm. even at a minimal level, right? I mean, this seems to be a very minimal level, that guy was saying, that, you know, yes... There was some AI. And you think about Adobe, Word. I mean, all these packages now come with little AI mm. bundled within them. So it's certainly... But flattening the image and cropping it is not it AI. Yeah. It's, there's no intelligence to that because it's doing exactly what you're telling it to do. Well, when, it's, when it's got, like, um, generative fill, that's definitely AI because it's taking parts of the image and trying to make something that's close to it. But, yeah. So, again, it's mm. one of these false positives, right? So if you're mm. dealing with platforms which are broken in terms of their ability to identify AI, you know, and maybe maybe it's like nine times out of ten it's fine with the automated process Instagram are using, but that one out of ten time it's wrong, this has real dramatic impact. And will they change that or not? Uh, and, well, they have changed it in terms of saying it's AI info, mm. which is a little vaguer, but still it, it tarnish, it's interesting that tarnishing, I guess, of an image uh, with that AI link now. That there was a period where everyone was getting into it, it felt like. Yeah. And now there's a kind of a huge backlash against it where having AI linked to your creative content is actually going to potentially trigger people to boycott. Like the case of the, uh, uh, what was that horror film, the um, interview with the devil or Nightlight, Night Light? Uh, late Night with the Devil. I think it is the Possession One, Australian film horror mm-hmm. that came out six months ago or so, and one of the background images was AI generated. That's right, that one, And yeah. this was a kind of indie film uh, that had mainstream distribution, but nevertheless, you know, small creative talent uh, and, you know, small little background image was AI generated, but once it got unleashed on the internet where people d- discovered it, it led to this backlash, which I think was completely unfounded in terms of it meant people didn't get to see this great bit of AI work. Mm. The other thing that I've noticed talking of our own automated systems, the um, 048811707 SMS feed, it has just collapsed in the studio. It really has. <laughs> it seems to be some form of, you know, I mean, ultimately, I guess that's a good example of why the old fashioned way still is important, right? That, yes, you might have supporting. AI aspects in your creative workflow, but you know it can it can crash. It can crash. I'm going to try and send a message. Oh, great! We'll have a message come through. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. no, no, no. Hey, you a Legend of Zelda fan? Hey, yeah. Really? Okay, we. I'll, I'll quickly get your view of this story. Okay. So if you go back to your webpage, uh, I talked about it already, but uh, ABC was reporting that a British man carrying a Legend of Zelda sword in public, has been arrested, was arrested, given um, like a £100 fine and four months in jail. (laughs) He said it was a fidget toy. I was talking about, you know, are there cultures or communities where that wouldn't be a problem? So I'm thinking of fans. But you have a look at that. It's 20 centimetres long. I mean, it's metal 
like it's it's got like a metal and even if it's plastic, it's spray painted metal, so it looks <laughs> Like a sword, right? It looks like a little dagger. I mean, it's 20 centimeters. Yeah. So, so, it's, so it's like a little letter opener sort of thing, yeah. really. Yeah. But the thing is, yeah, he was walking around in public. He got picked up on CCTV and he was busted. And the, the police just, did, like he said, oh, it's a fidget toy. I'm using it to, to relax. And he said, doesn't matter. Looks to me like a, saw, uh, a knife and zero tolerance. So you're copping the fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was trying to think maybe if the fan, if the police sergeant was like a, a Legend of Zelda fan. It's funny because they, <laughs> it, cause it says the, the Sergeant Spellman of Warwickshire Patrol Investigations Unit said police had zero tolerance to bladed articles in public. Yeah. But they do because of the Sikh community. Oh, really? Right. Who, uh, the males are obligated to carry a small dagger around, which they can use in terms of protecting other people's lives. But that's right. a religious Even item, in Warwickshire. which they're allowed to. Um. Well, we'll reach out. I mean, if you're a police officer in Warwickshire <laughs> <laughs> that's listening to us on our feed, if it works, I don't know if it does. Uh, well, f- first of all, having a little dagger as a fidget spinner toy is ridiculous. So yeah, I can, look, I can I mean, understand why they have gone against him. It's like you're, you've been lying to us, basically. Well, yeah, look, I mean, there's plenty of kind of... Uh, devices for fidget. So I. I but what's, what's the, what, can just, you, what can you fidget with that? Put oh, it's the, not one of the spinners. Yeah, put the little yeah. put the little dagger back in its scabbard and I, take it out. Uh, the texture, the texture. Some some fidget spinners are just texture, but like the poppet things, mm. that's just texture based. So I'm not going to discount the fact that that might have therapeutic value. Rubbish, mate. But I'm going to say clearly, <laughs> you know, look, if you get, you know, even the home base for this material like a fan convention they're so strict about swords mm. and guns right that, that it, it is really you know How that, many times that wouldn't you been even turned away at the door <laughs> <laughs> i just don't bring them anymore <laughs> um they wouldn't i mean i don't think you'd get into a convention if uh, with with a with a metallic looking sword you mm. like they're, they're so strict so yeah the, the thing that gets me is the related story British man stole 200,000 Cadbury cream eggs and will spend more than a year in jail. Why would you steal Cadbury cream eggs? They used to be so good, but now they're rubbish. Well, maybe these are the good ones, right? Like <laughs> okay. he was hoarding Well, them. then I can, I can understand why he did that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we've got 20 minutes left. Uh, let's jump to the K-pop story. Because while you're here, I'd like to get your views on this. Oh, of course. So uh, are you aware of this story? So this is on ABC News. No. Uh, K-pop group 17 is rivaling with Taylor Swift and making history in the UK. Here's why they're so popular. Do you know 17? Yes, of course. Oh, God dang. That's why you're here. All right. Well, let's, uh, without hopefully getting into a, um, you know, my YouTube stream collapsing, let's like, I could probably do five seconds. There you go. So no, that's then. you're done now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the article starts, and what I want to do is go through the article and ask you as a huge Uber fan and the fact that you do K-pop Unlimited from five to six, if this makes sense mm-hmm. to you. Okay. All right. So it starts with who's the most popular music act right now in the world. All right. And it says most people will probably say Taylor Swift. Um, but... The article argues that by at least one metric, it's actually a confusingly named Korean pop band who you might never heard of. Would you say that would be correct to an Australian reader, that, that they're A, confusingly named? Uh, 17, what's that? Oh, my God. That's... Are they all 17 would be my assumption. Well, if, if you've got flipping one direction, you can have 17. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, have they been heard of? Do you think a Western fan or a, West, a, a broad um... public, Western public would have heard of them? I, I can think of probably four or five acts, male, male acts, that are more well-known than them. Psy. Yeah. Psy. BTS. Exo. So 17 are a 13-member group, so they're not a 17-member group. <laughs> <laughs> so, so begins the confusion. 17, uh, and they're allegedly the biggest thing in K-pop genre right now. Are they the biggest thing in the K-pop genre right now? I don't know. I don't, I don't. I don't. You're not tapped into. Not right tapped now. in. I just listen to my. All right. They songs. did have. The, <laughs> they did have the biggest selling album in the world last year, F Mill. 
FML? FML. Yeah. Uh, according... Probably, knowing um, K-pop, it would be fun my life or something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it defines... So it starts with a subheading, what is K-pop? So they say K-pop, uh, range of music styles, musical styles and genres, and it's characterized by highly trained and polished artists and their immaculate synchronized dance routines. Is that effective definition? Um, yeah. First became popular in the 1990s with its US-influenced acts like Seo Taji and the Boys. Taiji. No, and the Boys. Read it. And, and Boys. And Boys. That's even worse. So Taiji and Boys. It's <laughs> even worse. Uh, they got Psy with Gangnam Style, of course. Which... <laughs> Gangnam Style, yeah. <laughs> Gangnam Style. Uh, according to Sarah Keith, senior lecturer in media and music at Macquarie Uni, K-pop is much more than just a style of colorful and upbeat music. She says K-pop describes the way of creating music and artists being identified with talent spotting and training and packaging the group and marketing. All right, so who's 17? So they came together in 2012. Were you aware of that, 2012? I like don't, you've I don't been know listening? dates. I don't know Okay, dates. but but they've been around. Yeah, yeah. Korean talent agency, record label, Pledis. Yeah, Pledis. Entertainment. Are they good? Um, they're an entertainment company. So the show's two-hour episodes, which primarily featured members. What is this talking about? What are the two-hour episodes? 17 TV. Yeah. Is that... Like, they've got their own, like, you, I could tune in to... A- so it says, they were first brought together by the talent agency for a live streaming sh- show, 17 TV, and it had two-hour episodes of live shows. Was this like a re- recruitment one where people dropped out and they were voting? No, no, it, as it says, it, practicing their singing and dancing in their studio. So sort of like getting ready to right. debut sort of thing. Inconceivable to a Western viewer. I mean, to an Australian viewer, I guess. Well, we've got Australian Idol would be the closest. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, okay. While the group initially had 17 members. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, over the course of the television show, members came and went. So then they ended up with 13. Groups divided into three subunits. So uh, subunits is something I think you've mentioned before. Yeah. Right? So you've got three subunits here. Hip-hop, rappers, vocal singers, and performers, dancers. Yeah. So you've got 30 members in total. You've got 30 with- members in total. In that, like four would be hip hop rappers, four would be vocal singers, mm. and and so they'd release their own sort of mm. songs or something like that. So the hip hop ones would have a rap song that they're rapping to. The vocal ones would have a very slow ballad song that they're singing along to, and the performance one might even, might not even have much of a singing role in their songs that they do because um, they perform. It's primarily a performance one. So they say that unlike most manufactured K-pop outfits, the members of Seventeen write and produce much of their own music. Mm-hmm. That's pretty rare. Yeah, it is. Uh, the first five-track EP, Seventeen Carats. Is that a good song? Seventeen Carats? You know? I don't know. I don't know. All right. Why do they have so many members? Okay, so even 13 people in a band might seem like a lot, but that's not unusual for K-pop genre. To me, it seems like a lot. Is 13 a lot? Not really. In K-pop? Not really. I mean, I mean, I guess it's on the higher end of it. Um, okay. But 11 is probably generally, probably 7 to 11 is how much you would usually have. Yeah. And then going down to maybe 5 or 3 if you're lucky. And then going up to this one. Because they say that with 13 people, okay, it seems like a lot. But the article explains that many of these groups, like 17, have subunits that allow the members to have their turn in the spotlight and give the management company the opportunity to play with group dynamics. So what does that mean? It means that one song might only have five people in it. Like all the Wait, Where are you reading this? Uh, it's after the subheading, why do they have so many members? So keep scrolling down. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Um, many of these groups, like 17, have subunits. Yeah. So it would, yeah. Yeah, it's what I was talking about. Yeah, so in so K-pop. They've got, they've got their own different songs. And different do songs. they all have to come, like, generally, I mean, beyond th- uh, 17 with 13 members, mm-hmm. uh, the subunits, do they, do all 30 members always have to be there on stage or in the video clip or sometimes it's just Well, I'm, I'm thinking of Eyes One. And, Eyes One. And the, um, the live show that I watched of theirs. And 
No. Just the vocals would come on and do their vocal song. And they would have a spotlight on them. Yeah, and just the rappers would then come on and do their rap song to give everyone their own turn in the spotlight with their particular skill set. Right. All right, yeah. So, And this was during COVID, right, that you watched that? Yeah. So they say this. So the next subheading, why are 17 so popular? They say during COVID, I was searching Spotify and getting ads with sounds that I liked and I would shazam it, and it was K-pop. Oh, who's that? That's Jan- oh, sorry, that's a fan. <laughs> well, that's important. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess um, uh, yeah, they had they've got a lot of fans. I, well, actually, it's the next one I'm more interested in. Why do K-pop bands do so well in able- album sales? So Seventeen's FML sold six point four million units. What are photo cards? So in this every is- album, you get a random photo card. And a random CD from a set of like six or seven really? and a random um, little cutout out of like the six or seven members and a random little um, j- like jacket sleeve out of the six or seven that are there. Jacket sleeve. Yeah. And so there are people, not, not like of like clothing. Just ripped. Like, ah. <laughs> Album jacket sleeve. Oh, I see. Right. Yep. <laughs> and um, then just like different photos or postcards or something like that. And right. everyone wants to collect all the different ones or at least collect the ones for their favourite uh, members of the band. So, yeah, if they don't get their favourite one, they'll actually buy five more mm. albums? Yeah. So there's a huge... like, And then they'd sell it on eBay or mm. something. F- Not even necessarily. if you Because if, you, if, you, if you're in Korea, buying an album is quite cheap. Really? Yeah, it's quite cheap. Well, well, um, would, you, would you be able to give a rough estimate? Probably like eight or nine dollars. Wow! Right, that's very cheap. Yeah, and well, because like when I've bought it before, it's been like eight or eight to twelve dollars. I've bought albums from Korea. It's been eight to twelve dollars, and then Postage. plus seventy two dollars shipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so you they'll right. have they'll have these big skip bins. And they'll be overflowing with these albums because you've had fans who have bought 200 shipments no. to try and make sure. So that there are stories out there. Like what would an average consumer engage, like an average fan? Right? Obviously you've got an Uber fan that might buy 200 units. Oh, I don't know what an average fan would. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay, the article does go on and talk about these lucky draw albums, which each include a random photo card out of the set. So fans have to purchase multiple copies to either get the photo card they want or even the full series. Mm. Um, so you can trade these photo cards. Um, uh, so because fans also trade photo cards of their favorite group members or biases. Mm. Biases. 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 Yeah. Is that a phrase in that fandom? Biases? That yeah. means biases which one you like? Yeah. Biases. And you have right. ultra bias, and you have bias wrecker. <laughs> <laughs> Go through these terms. So ultra bias is... Oh, it's not like super bias. I can't remember what it is. All right, right. Like, like ultra your... bias is like your number one out of all... Yep, the 13. No, out of everything. Oh, right, right, right. Ultra right. bias. Like in k Yeah. Psy. Psy. I have an ultra bias for... Maybe Hitchhiker. Hitchhiker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Psy is your, size your <laughs> ultra bias, and Hitchhiker is your bias wrecker. Because when he comes along, he takes the spotlight in your oh, heart. Oh, right. That's the bias wrecker. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, there's a moment in time where Psy was number one, <laughs> and he was my bias. Ultra bias, yeah. and then I have to tell the story of my bias record. Yeah, because in yeah, in twenty twenty four April tenth, I listened to Hitchhiker, and it was a bias record moment. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> I'm in the lingo. So okay, that's really fascinating in terms of yeah. So uh, fans also trade photo cards so for their to get their biases. Some of these cards go up to to $3,000 on secondary markets mm-hmm. with fans creating communities to buy and sell cards along with other merchandise around the world. Are you engaged in that world market? I was once to get a lenticular photo card that I wanted. Wow. What made it so important? Um, it was just an album that I really liked and I wanted to have my bias. Was it Foxtrot? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no? No, it was uh, twice as album uh, uh, fancy. Wow. Yeah. And that was your bias? Yeah, yeah. Do you still have it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's up on my wall. Wow. 
Great. Uh, and this was through one of these online trading markets. It was a Huge Malaysian markup. one, I think. Right, right, right. Um, Carousel. Yeah, yeah. What, wasn't it was that, like an auction thing. You had to bid for it. No, or... It wasn't that expensive either. Ah, lucky you. It was like eight bucks. <laughs> eight bucks. Yeah, well, you're sitting on that gold mine of bluey Bunnings <laughs> Gnomes. Yeah, gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. You've got two sets. I mean, this isn't too unusual. There are biases, of course, for, for mm. all pop culture. It's interesting. Well, that, that's like the bluey coin sets that came out recently. Where did you get those from? Um, the, the, like the Mint of Australia. Oh, yeah. Sydney Mint yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, you, you had to go into a, like a raffle in order to get the... Oh, right. In so order to buy them. Um, because they only had a limited run of a 1,000 for each one, and what turned off. <laughs> yeah, turned off again. And, um, yeah, so I think it was like $30 for one, for one dollar coin. Right. Then now at like $800, $900 for one one dollar coin. Oof. Oof. Yeah. Everyone loves Bluey. Yeah, Everyone yeah. So again, uh, what we're learning here, uh, so we'll wrap up now. Uh, what have I learned on today's episode? <laughs> Uh, ultra biases. Well, what was what was this what was this about? This, this honestly, this is just an info piece for people that want to figure out what K-pop is. But how how are they making history in the UK? How, <laughs> oh, how so seventeen so, demonstrating K-pop's over ever broadening appeal this week? They have become the first Korean act to play at the iconic Glastonbury Festival in the UK. Wow. Okay, so that's, that's, that's pretty good. How does that mean that they're more popular than Taylor Swift? Because they're not more popular than Taylor Swift. I mean, I like K-pop and I like Seventeen, but they are not more popular than well, Taylor they, Swift. They, said they by, can't go around the world and people gather in such massive droves they as they do for Taylor Swift. It's interesting, yeah, because they claim on the second sentence that by at least one metric, it's actually a... Uh, yeah, while many would assume it's Taylor Swift... By at least one metric, it's actually this band, 17. What metric? Male. Well, the Glastonbury Male. Festival. <laughs> <laughs> Male K-pop acts. No, well, I guess it's... Taylor Swift doesn't even did, chart. Did Taylor Swift perform at Glastonbury? Has she... I don't know. Actually. So this might be the metric. That could be, yeah. That, that they've, they're so big that they've been able now to perform at Glastonbury. Mm. So uh, wonderful to, to have you on. Unfortunately, yeah, the, the, the YouTube stream crashed again. <laughs> no one messages me. Well, they can't. It doesn't work. <laughs> I also have the chat on YouTube. Oh, fair enough. Oh, sorry. I actually had the, um, the image over your head anyway. Oh, that's no. There you go. Okay, well, uh, keep listening now to Edge Radio. Uh, we'll have K-pop and Linda coming up next. What's yeah, yeah, happening in, on? In a, in a while. I mean, I haven't got my songs ready for today, so... Right. Whenever I can play some music. Okay, yeah. All right, thanks for listening to Media Mothership. Uh, we'll be taking a break next week, so we'll be back in a fortnight. Uh, show notes and further information are available on our Facebook. And I won't be back for three weeks. Oh, wow, great. Because of what's behind you. The Grim Reaper? Yeah, well, in a way. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. You're, uh, you're doing your um, community theatre. Yeah, yeah. That'll be great. Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, 10 to 20 July at the Playhouse. You're on my stream saying this. You're going to have a huge audience. There. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> the Unexpected Guest. Unexpected Guest. So you, where can you go to find out more about The Unexpected Guest? Uh, playhouse.org.au. Okay, there we go. Uh, so keep listening now to Edge Radio. Coming up eventually over the next one-hour period will be K-Pop <laughs> Unlimited. <laughs> if you're lucky. With DJ TJ and DJ CJ. Thank you.